So I, uh, as uh, she introduced me, I'm a final year PhD student at IP2I in Lyon, and I work under the supervision of uh, Jerome Magron and Hubert Hansen. Uh, and today I would like to talk to you about so constraining the equation of state of dense matter using neutron star observations. Uh, yeah, so this is the outline of my talk. So first I will begin with a brief introduction. And during this introduction, I will uh, frame the fundamental question that we are trying to answer in this field. So basically the phase diagram of QCD. And this will naturally lead me to talk about neutron stars. And I will briefly uh, introduce neutron stars to you. And I will tell you why they are so interesting and why it now is the best time to start studying them. As far as my results are con uh, con uh, con concerned, I have divided the talk basically into two parts. One, which, uh, which primarily focus on the low density regime. So I will talk about chiral effective field theory results for infinite nuclear matter. And then uh, later, uh, I will talk about uh, results pertaining to higher density, and we will explore uh, phase transitions that could occur and lead to matter other than, other than uh, neutrons and protons, which could occur in uh, the heart of neutron stars. So this is the basic question that we would like to answer in this field, and it can be expressed in, uh, in this picture, the so-called phase diagram of QCD. So it, uh, this picture depicts what happens to matter when it is exposed to extreme conditions of temperature and uh, density. So usually uh, the average density that we explore on Earth is zero, and a lot of interesting things happen as you increase the temperature at zero density, uh, and can be explored in heavy ion collisions and stress, et cetera. But what in this talk, what primarily interests us is what happens when you keep the temperature fixed close to zero, but then you increase the density. So we know uh, here, uh, these are units such that one uh, indicates the densities in the bulk of atomic nuclei. So we know uh, fairly well how matter behaves. So we know that it's composed of neutrons and protons, and we know fairly well how they interact. But the question that really inter interests, interests us is what happens to matter when you ex expose it to much higher densities than what uh, than this uh, area. So if you explore much higher densities, then it's possible that in, instead of having just neutrons and protons, you have some exotic phases of matter. It's possible that uh, we have a, a, a transition to the confined quark matter. And the question that we would like to answer are, what is the nature of matter when you expose it to such extreme densities? Uh, density is so high that if you increase the density even a bit more, that matter collapses to a black hole. So we are talking about really dense matter. And we would like to answer questions regarding the composition of such matter and how the particles behave and how they interact. And the interesting point is that such matter is precisely what is explored in the heart of neutron stars as indicated here. And this is why neutron stars are very interesting to us. So uh, this is the motivation for studying neutron stars. So very briefly, what are neutron stars? Neutron stars, at least in my opinion, they're not really stars. They are the dead remnants of very massive stars. So when a star of uh, around eight to 20 times the mass of our sun, when it reaches the end of its lifespan, it explodes in a massive explosion called a supernova. And what's left over is, uh, is what's called a neutron star. And everything we can, every number we can associate to a neutron star is an extreme. So neutron stars can be twice as massive as our sun, but the diameter is only around 25 kilometers, and that's the size of a small city. So here you have an artistic impression of what that would look like if you would bring a neutron star and place it close to Earth. So it's the size is around the size of a city, but you, you have to imagine that the mass can be you know, twice, as mass, twice as massive as our sun. And uh, everything else, uh, you can think about neutron stars also extreme. They have extreme surface gravities. Uh, the, the magnetic fields in the crust of some neutron stars can be like, three or four orders of magnitude larger than anything that we can have on Earth. And they can also spin like at rates of hundreds of rota uh, rotations per second. So these are really extreme objects. Uh, the questions that we would like to uh, ask about neutron stars are primarily related to its composition. So here you have uh, a brief description of what neutron stars are made of. The outermost, in the outermost layer, you have an atmosphere, so which is composed of hydrogen and helium. So it's not very different from the atmosphere on Earth. But the neutron star, the surface itself starts from what we call the outer crust. 
So this is a solid and it is uh, composed of a lattice of positively charged ions or nuclei and it's immersed in a gas of electrons. As you move, as you move deeper inwards, uh, the neutrons which are inside uh, the atomic nuclei start dripping out. So in addition to an electron plasma, you also have a, a fluid of neutrons, a neutron gas, which now surrounds the lattice of uh, positively charged ions. So the crust is a solid. And as you move even inwards, you have the core of a neutron star. And this core, uh, at least the outer part of the core, what we call the outer core, is made up of a homogeneous infinite nuclear matter. So an infinite system of neutrons and protons. And, the, and if you go even uh, deeper into the neutron star, I, we have indicated that with a question mark. So this is the inner core. And here we really don't know the composition of matter. And this is where it gets really exciting. So we would like to ask questions about the composition of this matter. So is it just neutrons and protons all the way down to the inner core? Or is it possible that at densities before the collapse of matter into black holes, do we have the confined quark matter or do we have any other kind of particles such as meson condensates or k condensates that could occur in the heart of neutron stars? And the, the, uh, what I'm going to tell you now is that the best time to answer these questions is now. And that is primarily because that we are now living in an era of multimassive neutron star observations. So this error really started in August 2017 when uh, gravitational waves from the first ever binary neutron star module were detected on Earth. So here you have a numerical simulation of that event. So it shows you two neutron stars merging together and the corresponding waveform, which, uh, which is calculated using numerical relativity, which is shown below. And that this waveform was actually detected in August 2017 by the LIGO Virgo collaborations gravitational wave interferometer. And this really marked the era, the period of high precision neutron star observations. And this period is called the multi-messenger uh, era of observations because in addition to gravitational waves, uh, neutron stars can also emit neutrinos, which for instance can be uh, detected at the super Kamiokande. And they also emit photons. So we can also make electromagnetic observations uh, such as thermal X-ray observations, as well as radio detection. And radio detections, for instance, can be made uh, with the square kilometer array. So we have a lot of different ways of looking at neutron stars, and this leads to a variety of observables. We can measure their masses, we can measure their size, the radii, we can measure the so-called tidal deformability. So tidal deformability, the neutron stars get deformed. A neutron star gets deformed when it is placed in the strong gravitational field of another neutron star, such as what happens during a merger. So this deformability can also be measured, and indeed it was measured in this August 2017 event. We can also measure the angular momentum. We can measure uh, certain fluctuations in the angular momentum called glitches. We can measure the temperature and how it changes, changes as a function of time. So all this is to say that we have many different observables and very new fascinating techniques to measure them. So really, the and thanks to all these observations, we can now start answering questions regarding the composition. So how do we do that? Uh, in general, this is a very complicated problem. It's really a multi-physics problem involving scales, uh, involving a, a wide range of scales. But just to give you an idea of how this, uh, these kind of calculations are done, I've, I've created a slide to explain this to you in a nutshell. So you start with an assumption for uh, what the neutron stars are made of, uh, and, you, and, th and then you posit an, uh, a model for the interaction between the particles. So it, it looks something like this, roughly speaking. So it's, this is a Lagrangian. And then what you have to do is that you have to insert this into the mini body Schrodinger equation. And what comes up out of this is what we call the, new, the equation of state. So the equation of state for us primarily will be the pressure. So this is the pressure, uh, the repulsive force uh, uh, arise, uh, arising due to the interaction between the degrees of freedom inside neutron stars as a function of the energy density. So this is a quantity that keeps increasing as you go into the heart of neutron stars. So for every model that you can come up with, you can compute the equation of state if you know how to solve the Schrodinger equation. And uh, once you have that, what you would typically do is to insert this into uh, the Einstein field equations. Uh, usually the most common example is that you don't deal with the full equation. You deal with these equations applied to uh, static hydros in the hydrostatic limit. And in that limit, it's called the TOV equation, the tolman oppenheimer falkov equation. And this gives you neutron star observables. And in particular, the TOV equation will give you uh, a sequence of neutron stars and the masses and their mass and radii. So for every uh, equation of state, every curve you have here, you will have a corresponding mass radius curve. 
And then the way it works is that if you make observations of neutron star masses and radii, if you can select points here, for instance, if you know that the ma mass and radii of, cert of certain neutron stars lie inside this, sorry, lie inside this region, and you want to exclude certain curves, then this would ex exclude certain equations of state, which would in turn constrain the model. So you have to go all the way back through the loop. And this is briefly how it works. Uh, so, and I, I want to re-emphasize again that thanks to all these new observations that, that we have now access to, we now, uh, at least we believe that we know, uh, uh, for instance, the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. So it's around, we now believe that we know it to be around 12 kilometers plus or minus kilometer. And so given that neutron stars are really far away, like even the closest neutron stars are hundreds of light years away, the, the fact that we can measure the radius of a 1.4 solar mass star to a precision of a kilometer is really astonishing. But we now have the possibility to do so. And therefore, we can now start, go, we can now go back through the loop and start asking questions about the, the model and the way uh, these particles interact. And the rest of the talk will be primarily based on this left panel where we will be talking about uh, different models for the interactions between particles in the of neutron stars. So there are many different models that exist. Uh, in the market for nuclear matter, uh, primarily because we can't solve QCD exactly. Uh, instead of talking about all of them, I have picked one, and it's called chiral effective field theory. And uh, so I will be presenting results for this model for infinite nuclear matter. Uh, yeah, so what is chiral effective field theory? The central tenet of this model is that we write down the Lagrangian, the most general Lagrangian, which is uh, consistent with all the symmetries of QCD. So for instance, Lorentz covariance, et cetera. But in particular, we make use of the fact that the chiral symmetry, which, uh, which is a symmetry of QCD in the limit that quarks have zero masses, is spontaneously broken. So chiral symmetry is a symmetry which, uh, tell, which relates left-handed quarks, right-handed quarks. And if, if this is an exact symmetry when quarks have vanishing masses in QCD. And we know that it is spontaneously broken by the ground state of QCD. And we know from the theory of spontaneous breaking of global symmetries that whenever you have such a symmetry breaking, you have massless excitations out of these condensates called Goldstone modes of pions. And therefore, chiral effective field theory is primarily a theory of uh, nuclear forces mediated by pions. And this is a diagram which uh, briefly explains how the, nuclear, the two nucleon potential can be described just in terms of pions. So we know that roughly speaking, the nuclear nuclear potential has this shape. So at long distances, uh, so here R is the separation between two nucleons. So at long distances, you, we know that the nuclear interaction is mildly attractive and that is mediated by the one pion exchange. And as you go to uh, intermediate distances, then we know that there are correlated two pion exchanges, which uh, gives you this intermediate attraction as well. Uh, but we also know that very short distances, uh, the nuclear interaction is sharply repulsive. So it's the, uh, the nuclear interaction has this hard core. Now we know that physically there are heavier mesons such as the omega and the rho, which are responsible for this repulsion. But since these are beyond the cutoff scale of chiral effective field theory, what one does is that these are rho mesons and the omega mesons are integrated out and they are replaced by contact interactions. And so this is uh, very uh, roughly speaking how the theory works. Uh, and one uh, point that has to be clarified is that, so when I say that the Lagrangian is an, uh, has all terms consistent with the chiral symmetry, uh, so of course it's not possible because then you would have an infinite number of terms. And therefore what one does is that one arranges these terms in an expansion uh, of some small parameter Q, which is typically the mass of the pion or some small momenta suppressed with respect to some heavy scale. So, so the mass of the rho meson, which is left out for instance. And such an expansion has important consequences for nuclear phenomenology and also for nuclear astrophysics. It turns out that when you make such an expansion, and then if you represent the different terms in the Lagrangian by diagrams, what arises is a natural hierarchy between the many body forces. So at the leading order of the chiral expansion, you have only two nucleon forces. And so uh, also in NLO, so next leading order, you only have two nucleon forces. So we know that these are now that these are the forces that are relevant at lower densities and lower uh, momenta transfers. But when you go to higher orders, three nucleon forces appear naturally. So this hierarchy that uh, many body forces like higher body forces arise only, higher, only at higher orders in the chiral expansion is really something which is novel to chiral effective field theory. In most phenomenological models, you don't really have this hierarchy between many body forces. 
So this is a really important feature. And once you have all these diagrams and once we have derived the nuclear potential in this way, what we can do is, uh, so these potential will have some uh, coupling constants, which are then fit to uh, nucleon nucleon phase shifts, uh, at least for the two nucleon forces. And the three nucleon forces are fit to uh, the binding energy of some very small uh, nuclei. So with, with such a theory, we can make computation for the equation of state. Uh, before presenting some results, I wanted to talk uh, very briefly, introduce the concept of the equation of state itself. So I already told you that the equation of state is the pressure as a function of the energy density, but most microscopic calculations will yield uh, primarily a quantity called energy per particle. And But of course, the two are related. If you differentiate the energy per particle as a function of the number density, you will get the pressure. And brief, like very, uh, without going into all the details, this is what a calculation of the energy per particle would look like. So you can consider an infinite system of matter in which there are equal number of neutrons and protons. That's called symmetric matter. And the energy per particle is shown here as a function of density. And a generic feature is that all results at some point will have a slope of zero. So this is called the empirical saturation point. And it is very important because this is the density explored in the bulk of atomic nuclei. So therefore what one does is you take the energy particle in infinite nuclear matter and expand it as a function of X, where X is a small parameter, which is at zero at saturation density. And then like it captures small fluctuations around saturation density. And then when you do that, the coefficients are called nuclear empirical parameters. And because of the fact that nuclei explore, uh, finite nuclei explore regions close to saturation point, you can measure at least some of these parameters by from terrestrial experiments on nuclei. So similarly, you also have something for pure neutron matter. Uh, here, the energy is always positive. And even though there is no fixed, uh, there's no real point at which uh, it saturates, uh, you can still use the same expansion parameter and expand the energy particle in tail expansion. And at least the lower order parameters such as EPNM and LPNM can also be measured by from nuclear experiments. Uh, so what we can do is uh, we can actually confront such expansions uh, also to theoretical calculations, for instance, those made by chiral EFT. And in fact, what, I, what I'm going to present to you is such a confrontation in which these parameters are varied in a Bayesian way. So the, finally, here are some results from Kyle effective field theory. So this corresponds to infinite nuclear matter. The top row is uh, infinite uh, symmetric matter, so matter with an equal number of neutrons and protons. And the bottom row corresponds to neutron matter. So a matter with only neutrons. Uh, and the different columns are uh, actually different representations of the same quantity. So the left column, you have the energy divided by the energy of a free Fermi gas uh, as a function of the Fermi momentum. On um, the middle column, you have the, the, the same quantity on the vertical axis, but now on the horizontal axis, you have the number density. And on the third column, you finally have the most canonical representation, which is just the energy as a function of the number density. The chiral effective field theory results themselves are shown as data points. So these are the blue circles. And the fact that there is an uncertainty really explores the uncertainty in the coupling, in the couplings that are fit to nucleon-nucleon uh, phase shift. So this is why there's an uncertainty. And the red bands come from a confrontation of this expansion that I showed you in this previous slide, and, and which, uh, which is obtained by varying these empirical parameters in a certain prior and then fitting that to the chiral EFT results. And you see that the red bands are quite consistent with the data. And in fact, like you even get posteriors on the nuclear empirical parameters in this way. I have not represented this table here, but if for those who are interested, you can see the tabulated values for the nuclear empirical parameters in this paper. And, uh, and what we found was that the results are quite consistent with other theoretical calculations and also from what you would expect from experiments on finite nuclei. So this result is really interesting and it's a good triumph for chiral EFT. So here are more results for infinite uh, matter. Uh, so in this time, instead of showing you like a Bayesian band, we, uh, we, we are showing you the results of individual Hamiltonians. So again, the top column corresponds to the energy particle in symmetric matter. The, sorry, the top row corresponds to symmetric matter. The bottom row corresponds to neutron matter. And this time, uh, all, the, all the dashed lines are chiral effective field theory Hamiltonians. Whereas uh, what we have done now is that we've plotted also a lot of solid lines and these are all skirm interactions. So the purpose of this slide is to compare chiral EFT results with skirm interactions. And so you see in the top panel, so here this panel is the energy particle as a function of the number density. 
And we see that the skirm forces, which are all these solid lines, are close to saturation density. They are much more concentrated. And the dispersion is a lot lower compared to uh, the parallel EFT dashed lines. Uh, this is because uh, skirm interactions are fitted to the saturation property, which explains why they have a much smaller dispersion. Whereas for, chiral, for the case of chiral EFT, this is a pure prediction. Uh, and, th and therefore there are some uncertainties related to these predictions and, this, and therefore you see a larger spread. However, for the case of neutron matter, you see the exact opposite. So in neutron matter, especially in this panel, when you scale the results on the vertical axis with respect to the free Fermi gas energy and plot it as a function of the Fermi momentum, you see that the skirm forces, these solid lines, they are really unconstrained. Uh, they have a huge dispersion, whereas the dashed lines, which are which represent chiral EFT results, they, they have explored a much narrow range. So this is because chiral uh, EFT uh, is, since it's fitted to nucleon nucleon phase shifts, and uh, so because they fit to uh, microscopic data, they, uh, they are much better in reproducing low density features of neutron matter. And this is why chiral EFT predictions are much better as compared to the spread in the skunk predictions. So the, in fact, there has already been a talk uh, by, uh, by Gillian Grams, who is a postdoc in the same group as I am. And he, he uh, used some, uh, these results basically, or results very similar to this to compute properties for the crust of neutron stars. And there uh, we really see the impact of chiral EFT uh, calculations for the crust, because since the crust has a gas of neutrons, uh, the fact that the chiral EFT predictions are much more narrow will have uh, impact for the, for the crust. Whereas certain properties such as uh, the crust composition in terms of the atomic number and mass number, those will be more influenced by the symmetric matter properties. And, and there, uh, the skirm force is expected to be better. But for more information, you can see the talk of Guilherme and uh, where he explains all these things very clearly. So another result I would like to present to you is the symmetry energy. So the symmetry energy is the energy of particle in neutron matter minus the energy of particle in symmetric matter. Uh, and this is what's shown in, this, in the column on the left here. So again, these blue dots are parallel EFT calculations and the red band is comes from our Bayesian confrontation against the data. In the middle panel, we have, uh, we have shown the same quantity, but this time the, the, the contribution from the free Fermi gas has been subtracted out. So what you see here is purely the contribution to symmetry energy coming from the potential, the interaction, the nuclear interaction. So from the potential part, and you see that at saturation, it's around 18.1 MeV. So it's around like 12 or 14 MeV lower than the, the full symmetry energy case at saturation density. And finally, the third column on the, on the right, that corresponds, it's a very similar quantity to EPOT, but it's EPOT star because this time the kinetic energy that we have subtracted out also has an, the nucleon effective mass inside. So this actually has, uh, has the impact of raising the symmetry energy a little bit as compared to the middle panel. And then at saturation density, this is around 25.7 MeV. Um, so this is an interesting result. And we have more results for the symmetry energy. This time, again, instead of showing a Bayesian band, we have confronted individual chiral EFT models against individual SCIR models. So on the left panel, you have the symmetry energy as a function of the density. Uh, and on the right panel, you have the same thing. But again, you have this normalized with respect to the free Fermi gas as a function of the Fermi momentum. And so what you see here, again, is that so the dashed lines, the chiral EFT lines, they explore a narrower range as compared to the skirm forces for which uh, the, the dispersion is much larger. This is due to the fact that uh, in neutron matter, as we saw, the chiral EFT explores, an, explores, an, explores a narrower range. And we see that the skirm forces can give either uh, energies larger or smaller than the chiral EFT predictions. Uh, and finally, so in this panel, you see that uh, uh, in the in the big, uh, not counting the inset. So in this axis, we have stopped the calculation at around half saturation density, because this is the density at which chiral EFT is expected to break down. But in the inset, just uh, just to show you, we also show results for much larger densities. Uh, even though chiral EFT cannot be used to calculate these uh, densities, we have uh, performed an extrapolation based on the fact that. Uh, we have seen uh, neutron stars with, uh, with a mass of two solar masses. So based on some country constraints from these heavy pulse observations, the dashed chiral EFT lines have been extended to larger densities. 
Uh, whereas the skirm forces, it is interesting because you see that ar at around uh, saturation density, the skirm forces, they start bending down for the symmetry energy. And this is a generic feature of skirm forces. It's well known uh, from these phenomenological zero range interactions that they start bend the symmetry energy starts bending down. And in fact, at large densities, you see that it actually, the symmetry energy actually becomes negative. Um, yeah, so these are some of the results that I wanted to show for uh, from chiral EFT calculations. As I already told you, they have important implications for the crust, especially when you compare implications from the crust from chiral EFT versus that of SCRM. And I think uh, Guilherme has done a, a very good job of presenting it in a previous previous GDR talk. And I would, if you're interested, I would encourage you to see that talk as well. So these are the conclusions of uh, part one. So what I basically presented to you is that chiral EFT has now proven to be a very powerful tool. It, uh, it's an expansion basically in low momenta. So it is, you can think of it almost as a density expansion. So it's, it, it works better at low densities it, and at higher densities, even though it doesn't work perfectly, it can systematically be improved by going higher and higher in the chiral expansion. Uh, however, uh, as, with all chiral, as with all effective field theories, it does have a breakdown density and it's expected to be around twice nuclear saturation density. And the primary problem is that neutron stars expose matter several times that. So they explode matter at around like five to eight times saturation density. And there it would be, we really need something more than just chiral EFT to address these answers. So this naturally takes me to part two because uh, it is certainly possible that at higher densities, you have more than just neutrons and protons, more than just infinite nuclear matter. It is certainly possible that you have degrees of freedom like a deconfined quark matter. And a theory like chiral EFT, uh, at least in its present form, cannot address these problems because by construction, the theory of neutrons and protons. Uh, but it is, uh, it is important that we also take into account the fact that uh, phase transitions can occur. And this is what we will look at at part two of our talk. So uh, are there any questions at this point? Um, yeah, otherwise uh, I will finish part two and then we can have questions. So phase transitions. Usually when people talk about phase transitions, what, uh, what is generically referred to as a phase transition is a first order phase transition. And uh, first order phase transitions are ubiquitous in nature and in neutron stars, you can have a first order phase transition to deconfined quark matter or pion condensates or anything which is really not just nuclear matter. And therefore, in order to encapsulate all these possibilities, I will just refer to the matter after the phase transition as exotic matter. Uh, but if you want to have a concrete picture in mind for exotic matter, you can just think quark matter. So what happens in phase transitions is that, so at low pressures and low energy densities, you have a normal nuclear matter equation of state. And then at some point when the transition happens, you have a discontinuous jump in the energy density. And this is called the latent heat. And during this jump, the pressure remains constant. And due to the fact, it's, you recall that for a neutron star, it's really the nuclear pressure which keeps the stars up, so which is responsible for the radius. And if the pressure remains constant, as you move deeper into the bulk of neutron stars, the star will shrink because there's not a lot of pressure to balance the gravitational force. And this is why I've written here that first order phase transitions typically lead to a reduction in the pressure. And this can be, and we have performed some calculations with uh, first order phase transitions. So let's focus first maybe on this panel. So here you have uh, a lot of things. So let's go step by step. So these contours, these represent experimental observations. So the, the yellow one, this represents gravitational wave observations. Uh, the green uh, contour, these, uh, this is uh, uh, an X-ray observation of uh, 1.4 solar mass pulse star made by NASA's NICER collaboration. And similarly, this is also an, an X-ray observation of the heaviest pulse star that we know, 3740. Uh, and then what we have computed is the mass radius relations of several equations of state. So in this red dashed line, we have the skirm Sleefor equation of state. Uh, it's, it's the equation of state which is commonly used in astrophysical simulations, but you see here, interestingly, that it's outside the band of G0740. So it's something, at least the 68% confidence level at which this measurement is reported, the sleep 4 equation of state is ruled out. Uh, so therefore, what we did is that we took the sleep 4 equation of state and then changed one of the empirical parameters so that it becomes a bit more stiff. And I will use this as a nucleonic equation of state as a base to construct phase transitions, right? And all these phase transitions are first order phase transitions are shown in black. 
So, and these are the different black lines and they differ at uh, this parameter NFO, which is the density at which the phase transition occurs. So you can see that as you increase this uh, transition density, uh, the, the, the black lines start deviating from the red line at different points. And you see a generic feature, which is that they always prefer, once you have a phase transition, the radius of a star of the stars of which contain quark, uh, exotic matter is much smaller than the corresponding nuclear radius. On the panel of the right, you have something very similar. In this case, for the first order phase transitions, instead of changing the point at which the transition occurs, I change this latent heat, this uh, gap during which the pressure remains constant. And if you see that if the gap is larger, then the equation of state becomes uh, really soft. So it has you have really soft radii. So this fact that first order phase transitions decrease the radius is what is genetically known and commonly believed. Uh, but recently we performed some calculations in which we isolated certain uh, regions of the parameter set where we realized that first order phase transitions can actually lead to radii larger than the purely electronic case. So for instance, on the panel on the left, we have chosen the density at which the transition occurs such that the, the transition occurs at really low densities. So it affects only a low mass neutron stars. But then we have chosen the interaction on the exotic phase to be really strong, such that at, uh, at canonical mass stars and at even larger masses, you have actually larger radii. And similarly here, we have chosen some parameters such that the FOPT, the black curves are actually stiffer, uh, or at least they can masquerade as nucleonic stars in, at the intermediate uh, mass range. Uh, so this is what I've written here, and uh, you can find more results uh, related to this stiffness versus uh, uh, softness of the equation of state with phase transitions in, in this paper. So, uh, so far I've, I've talked only about first order phase transitions, and but it's important to realize that uh, phase transitions can be, there are, there are different types of phase transition. Uh, the, the transition does not necessarily lead to uh, an, a discontinuity in the energy density. In fact, it can be analytic. And one really uh, interesting example is the quartionic model. And uh, this is what I would like to talk to you about now. So the, trend, the central tenet of quartionic model is that at least deep inside the Fermi surface of uh, in momentum space, the degrees of freedom can be treated as quarks. Uh, and this is what is represented. So this is... Um, uh, in momentum space, and this is the Fermi, this is the Fermi picture, and the uh, and the Fermi sea of quarks is represented by this yellow uh, sphere, and they are supposed to be deeper inside uh, as compared to the Fermi surface, and they're treated as quarks. Now, the interaction between the quarks is strong, so it is a confining interaction. However, these interactions are blocked by poly uh, poly blocked effects uh, because of Fermi statistics. And therefore, uh, you cannot treat them, treat these degrees of freedom as those which are confined inside nucleons. You really have to treat them as quarks. However, close to the Fermi surface, so close to this sphere, the interaction, the confining interaction is no longer poly blocked. And therefore, quarks do interact. And due to these correlations, nucleons emerge, but they occupy only a shell of this thickness delta on top of this Fermi sea uh, of quarks. So you have this multi-component uh, picture where you have a Fermi shell of baryons sitting on top of this uh, Fermi sea of quarks. And this is the central basic picture of quarkionic matter. And recently people have uh, up, made a phenomenological model of quarkionic matter and applied it to neutron stars. And in fact, these have recently even been extended to the isospin asymmetric case. So here, for instance, you have a similar picture, but you see that the neutron Fermi surface is Fermi, uh, Fermi momentum is not equal to that of the proton. So you can see that can be generalized to isospin asymmetric cases. And some of the basic equations look like this. So the total baryon density that receives contribution from the, nu the nucleon density as well as the quarks. But uh, so of course the quark Fermi momentum, which is the thickness, which is the radius of this inner dashed red uh, circle is the, the radius of the, of the outer circle minus delta, which is the thickness of the baryon shell. But it is, has this factor in C, where N C is the number of colors. And uh, if you insert the insert this expression there, you will see that the contribution of the quarks to the total baryon density is suppressed by a factor of N C cube. So this means that once quarks start appearing, the rate of change of baryon density decreases. And for reasons that I will not get into fully, it can be shown that if this happens, once quarks start appearing in this quarkion picture, the pressure inside the neutron star will start building rapidly. And this is what is illustrated here in this picture. 
So here you have the pressure as a function of the density and this uh, violet line is a sperm interaction. So it's pure nuclear matter. And then uh, these different green lines are, are different quaternion models with, with the changing, with the change of a certain parameter. And you see that at this point, uh, the parameters are chosen such that the quarks appear at this point. So after quarks appear, you see that the pressure increases much more rapidly uh, in, in, quark, in the quaternion phase as compared to the sperm force. And uh, recall that I told you that if the pressure increases, then the neutron stars will have larger radii. And uh, so again, I have this figure in the mass radius plane where we have several curves. So most of the curves are what we've already discussed before, but in addition, now I have these blue curves called quaternion matter. So again, uh, so these quaternion matter curves are constructed on top of this nuclear equation of state. And I've considered two different values for this lambda, which is the parameter that controls at what density quarks appear. And you can see that when quarks start appearing, you get much larger radii uh, in the mass radius plane. In the left panel, uh, you have this typical case where this black first order phase transition soften the radius. Uh, but uh, as I already told you that we, we can choose the parameters of a first order phase transition such that the radius are larger or at least comparable to that of the purely nucleonic case. And um, so this is uh, the mass radius landscape basically when you have different kinds of phase transition. Now, the question that you may be asking yourself is that since this is so complicated, is there really a way to look at just uh, uh, the astrophysical data and try to figure out whether phase transitions exist or not? But for that, we need, uh, it would be really nice if you could have one simple thermodynamical quantity, which we can look at and we say that, aha, if that behaves a certain way, then we have phase transitions. And uh, we believe that we have something like this, something like an order parameter. And this is the sound speed. So this sound speed is the derivative of the pressure as a function of the energy density. And it has the interpretation of uh, the speed of sound of the propagation of pressure waves. And therefore it's a quantity between zero and one where one is the speed of light. And you see that if you plot the sound speed for different uh, matter hypothesis, you see that uh, it has very distinct features. So for instance, if you have a quaternion equation of state, which is blue in color, you see that it has this bump. Whereas for first order phase transitions, which are shown in uh, green and black, you see that there's a point at which it discontinuously drops to zero and stays zero for a while. So if we can just look at the astrophysical observations and try to detect some key uh, signatures in the sound speed, then we will know that uh, at least we will have a strong hint that phase transitions exist. So this is what we try to do in a very agnostic way. We decided to vary the sound speed in a, in a very arbitrary manner without any uh, a priori assumption on the composition of neutron stars. So our, the analysis starts with the panel here on this left panel. So we just take the sound speed, which is zero and one as a function of density, and we discretize the density grid. And then we join these different points in the grid by straight line. So this is called the speed of sound extension scheme. And uh, it's numerically very cheap, and we can do this how many ever times we want. The reason that there are different colors is that we also, when we do this extrapolation, we, we also, we can impose some constraints on how much they can fluctuate. And, and based on how much they fluctuate, we, we classify them into different groups, group one, group two, group three. So these are shown as different colors. And once you have the sound speed, you can integrate that to get the equation of state, the pressure as a function of the energy density shown here. And then you can solve the TOV equations to get the mass and the radius. So of course, like if you can do this like three or four times, we can do this how many ever times you want. And we did this for tens of thousands of times. And, uh, and then uh, what I've shown here are just the mass and the radius. I don't show the sound speed itself for all these equations of state, that would be really messy. But instead I show uh, all these thousands of equations of state uh, that we considered in the mass radius plane. And you have three panels because of these three groups that I talked about, which are shown here at three different colors. And uh, so you see that we have many, many thousands of equations of state here, and they're all shown in gray. Whereas the ones that satisfy, whereas what we really are interested in are the ones that satisfy astrophysical constraints, all the astrophysical constraints that we have, and those are shown in green. And to be precise, the astrophysical constraints that we consider here are this X-ray observation of this uh, 1.4 solar mass star by the NISO collaboration, and then the similar observation of the heaviest pulsar, G0740, this gravitational wave constraint, which here is just shown as a blue vertical bar. So it, it, it imposes an upper limit on the radius. And we also consider upper and lower limits on the maximum mass. 
So basically, equation, equations of state which satisfy all these constraints are shown in green. Now we just want to look at the sound speed of these equations of state, only those shaded in green, and see if there are any indications of phase transition. And this is what we observed. So basically, we uh, when we did this, when we looked at all the green equations of state of the previous slide, we, the, we, we were able to isolate some cases in which the sound speed behaved like this. Once again, I remind you that the different colors correspond to different groups. And so you see that in, in this panel, uh, so it's called no FOPT because it's, uh, the, uh, no FOPT means that no first order phase transition was explicitly put into the model, but it can, uh, it can uh, happen by itself that uh, astrophysical observations select those cases in which a phase order phase transition exists. And this is what we observed. So you see something which really looks like a phase transition. It really looks like this bump that I showed you about quark ionic matter later, uh, earlier. And to make this clear, I also uh, compared this with cases in which a first order phase transition was explicitly put in. And you see that you have this uh, bump here, uh, the sound speed is a bit large, and then it goes to zero as expected for a first order phase transition. So by comparing these, uh, the panel here on the left versus panels B and C, you really see that uh, even though we impose no first order phase transition or any first order phase transition a priori, it looks like the astrophysical observations uh, want to have some sort of structure like this bump in the sound speed profile. However, this is not the entire story. While we were able to isolate this case, we were able to also isolate cases which look like this. And here we do find that there is no conclusive evidence for first order phase transition. So here for, or any other phase, any other phase transition. So here you see, for instance, that you have this blue line here, which is really, it's purely monotonically imprisoned. It has no bump, it has no discontinuous drop to zero, and it has no significant structure. So the conclusion is that while present astrophysical data allow for phase transitions to occur, like what we have here, it is by no means conclusive. It does not require uh, necessarily the presence of phase transitions. And uh, so this is the conclusion of a paper that we are writing and will be published soon. So uh, this brings me to my final conclusion. Uh, so what I have presented to you uh, are the following. So at first, I wanted, to I wanted to emphasize that we are in an era of multi muscular astronomy, and we are living in an era where more and more precise observations of neutron stars are becoming possible. And this is now, the time is ripe for using these observations to understand matter inside neutron stars. And what we discussed in today's talk is that we discussed chiral EFT and how advances in chiral EFT can be used to constrain the equation of state up to twice saturation density. So this has implications from the outer crust of neutron stars up to the inner core. Uh, but deeper into the inner core, you could have exotic degrees of freedom and you could have phase transitions. We we discussed two different types of phase transitions, uh, first order phase transitions and the phase transition to quark ionic matter. And then we explored a very agnostic approach to determine if these transitions exist, the, uh, we, uh, to determine if these can be inferred from astrophysical data. And what we found is that uh, while astrophysical data allow for phase transitions to exist, it is by no means uh, mandatory. It's possible that there are no phase transitions and it's just neutrons and protons all the way. But despite the uh, fact that astrophysical data is inconclusive, we could have a very definitive answer in the near future because neutron star observations are improving every day. And some of the results that I presented to you establish a clear framework and how we could use these upcoming observations to finally answer the question of whether there are phase transitions or not in neutron stars. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.